Hosea chapter 1, and uh, we're finally getting to the start of the minor prophets, and uh, last week we looked at the little minor prophets are not so little and not so minor, small books maybe, but uh, impactful books, uh, books that pack a big punch, you might say. Hosea is an interesting book, a uh, little book, 14 chapters. Hosea, a prophet to the northern kingdom of Israel, a prophet that uh, really begins to go and, and cast doom and gloom to that nation, and uh, an interesting book that as you begin to read it, there brings questions, and then it does bring answers uh, that'll help all of us. And so what we're going to do is we're going to read the first two verses of Hosea chapter 1, if you can, with uh, stand with me. In honor of God's word, Hosea chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, and we'll read those together in unison. Ready? The word of the Lord that came unto Hosea, the son of Beri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. The beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take unto thee a wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms, for the land hath committed great whoredom, departing from the Lord. And then it'll continue on. And he took a lady named Gomer to be his wife. And uh, they had three children, Jezreel, lo Rahaim, and lo Ami. And then this unfaithful wife began to commit whoredoms, and uh, as you read it, it uh, gets to the point she gets indebted to her lovers, and uh, her husband still loves her, still cares for her, and actually goes and purchases her back. And it's an interesting story, the book of Hosea, uh, a prophet to the northern king of Israel. A lot to learn tonight. Let's pray one more time. Dear Father in heaven, we've come to you a lot tonight because we need you. And the book of Hosea brings a lot of questions. You read the first two verses and you just immediately say, what? And it doesn't make any sense. But God, you make sense of no sense. And God, I pray that you help us to open our hearts and our minds to give us understanding and wisdom. You had a reason for Hosea going to the land of Israel. And there's some things that we can learn tonight that will help us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I love the Bible. We've been uh, studying book by book, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, and we've been studying and looking and searching the scriptures, the word of God, it's quick, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. One of the purposes of studying a book like Hosea, uh, by studying the book of Daniel or studying the book of Joel or Amos or Obadiah, is as when you go to the Bible in your personal Bible reading, like of course you all do, you get there and you understand a little bit better what you're reading. And the idea is to have a little bit better understanding of the book of Hosea. Uh, it's an amazing 14 chapter book. And really it's a story of a broken home and a husband with a broken heart. It's a broken home. And you'll see that very cl clearly that Hosea had a wife a wife of whoredoms. It was a broken home. He had a broken heart. And uh, Hosea was a son of Beri, and he was a man who was faithful, and he was willing to endure an intense amount of heartache, pain, and struggle to make the message, the message of God, clear to a rebelling nation. And uh, Hosea uh, covers about 60 years of life. He was uh, the prophet during the reign of Jeroboam in the northern kingdom of Israel. And I'm going to draw a little bit of a map here to sort of help you around. Oh, see, I tell you what, it is Christmas time. You all are giving me a Christmas gift of encouragement. And uh, I appreciate that right there very, very much. The uh, wonderful maps here. And uh, oh, if we draw our Italian boot right here, oh, that's beautiful, Pastor. Thank you. Uh, uh, this is our Grecian map right here. The Black Sea is over here, and we go over here to Turkey, and we get over here to the land of Israel, and uh, we have the Red Sea down here, and that's beautiful, Pastor, thank you. Then we have right here the Dead Sea. There's not anything living in that Dead Sea. The Sea of Galilee is right here. Jerusalem's right here. 
And if we were to enlarge this or think about this, the nation of Israel, circle that, the nation of Israel, God's nation, the uh, first king of Israel, King Saul, the second king of Israel, King David. And wow, David had a heart for God, a love for God. Solomon, wow, a wise man, uh, really began strong but ended bad, uh, had 700 wives, 300 concubines, uh, the land turned to false gods. After Solomon, uh, we had a man named Rehoboam come as king. And Rehoboam divided the kingdom. It became the northern kingdom of Israel, right here. See that I right there? That's the northern kingdom of what? Israel. And then the southern kingdom of Judah. It's very interesting, the dividing line right here. This one nation became two nations. The northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of, of, of Judah. And what happened immediately, when the northern kingdom had a king named Jeroboam, he was told to serve God. He was told to honor God. He had a choice to serve God. He had a choice to honor God, but he didn't. He began to look at it. He said, hey, Rehoboam's the king of Judah. I'm the king of Israel. And the place of worship at that time was Jerusalem. Solomon's temple in all its grandeur, all its glory was south of them. It was in the south right there in Jerusalem. And all of a sudden, the king Jeroboam began to think. He said, man, you know, if we have people go once or twice a year down to Jerusalem, it'll take their hearts and turn them back to the, the southern kingdom of Judah. It'll take their hearts back to the, the king Rehoboam. He says, we can't have that. So he immediately made some false gods, golden gods, and set them right across here in Bethel. And you'll see terms in the minor prophets like go to, to Bethel and transgress. And what it was is he said, rather than go in Jerusalem to worship, the place to worship is now Bethel. Go to Bethel. Serve these gods. And you think about that. The northern kingdom, oh, it began to have a downward spiral into sin, a downward spiral into idolatry, a downward spiral into serving false gods. And think about a society. 100 years, years past, sin that was not normal at the time of Jeroboam becomes normal. Sin that was not normal at the time of Solomon or even uh, David becomes normal. We begin to see, you know, what, what was that temple? Well, our grandfather used to go to the temple and serve God, but we don't do that anymore. We go to Bethel. We serve these golden gods right here. And they set up those golden gods in Bethel. And Israel uh, turns into idolatry, into more idolatry, into more uh, heathen worship. And 200 years go by. The kings of Israel... Uh, one dies, another dies, but they go from wicked to more wicked to more vile to more vile. And here this northern kingdom has Jeroboam. It's the second Jeroboam, king of Israel in the north. And God sends a prophet named Hosea. Hosea is now a prophet to the northern kingdom of Israel. Now, we'll continue on there. I'll go back to my map as you're excited about that, I can tell. Uh, at this time... About 785 B.C. to 725 B.C., uh, Isaiah and Micah were prophesying in Judah. And we think about in the southern kingdom of Judah, we had Isaiah, the great grand book of Isaiah, and Micah were prophesying to uh, the southern kingdom of Judah. And at this time, we had Amos and Hosea. They were prophets to the northern kingdom of Israel. And remember, the northern kingdom, like I said, went from bad king to bad king to bad king. And in, in this base, I'm going to give you a basic couple, uh, about a minute overview of the book of Hosea, and then we're going to get into the nitty gritty, okay? But the book of Hosea, God calls Hosea to marry an unfaithful woman. He says, go marry you a woman uh, that is a harlot. Sure enough, Hosea marries Gomer, has three children with the harlot, and just as a harlot is, she is unfaithful to him, and she doesn't have a love for her husband. She has no love for her children, and it's a sad situation filled with pain and anguish of family where the mother loves not her husband and loves not her children. And through the whole of this tragic family, the husband amazingly still loves her husband, her, her, his wife. The husband loves his wife and goes out of his way to buy back his wife from the results of her fornication. And the tragic marriage there is a picture of the northern kingdom of Israel's relationship with God. God had did so much for that northern kingdom of Israel, had given them so much, 
had purchased so much for them, uh, loved them so much, yet they go, to ser- go down to Bethel and transgress. They go to Bethel and serve false gods. And God loves them and cares for them. And it's a picture of that. The Lord being the faithful husband and Israel being the unfaithful wife. God loves his bride despite, the bride despite her unfaithfulness. Now, we're going to look at these 14 chapters a little bit more closely. And uh, we're going to look and start with uh, going into two sections. And I'm going to write this right there. Hosea. Hosea, just see the excitement building right here. One through three. Uh, chapters one through three. And then the section section is going to be chapters four through 14. And so uh, the first section right here, we're going to look at it, is the agony of an unfaithful spouse. Just say that. The agony of an unfaithful spouse. Now, I'm going to tell you a story, then we're going to get into it. I remember about seven or eight or nine years ago, I don't know, it was a while back, I remember sitting in my office, a husband and wife came to see me. They weren't members of the church, I barely knew them, and they came in and sat in my office, and uh, the husband, he began to weep and cry. And here they brought their their two-month-old baby in there, and there's their two-month-old baby, and he's just crying and weeping, and he says, my wife has been unfaithful. And I I said, what are you talking about? He says, well, we just had a baby two months ago, and my wife has committed adultery with another man. And she's sitting there. He's weeping. She's got the cold stare. Doesn't care. And I began to ask her, and she had that look of, I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. I've done it. That's correct. Not denying it at all. I have, and I don't care. And the man just began to weep uncontrollably. He loved his wife. And I'm not saying he was perfect. He wasn't perfect. But the whole thing was ripping his heart out. It was breaking his heart. Here was a woman who just had his baby two months ago, commits adultery, and has no care or no no care about it at all. And this man has just ripped his heart out right there. He's weeping and uncontrolled. And, and you may not know agony, but that was a picture when I saw that of agony. And the agony of an unfaithful spouse. The agony. Chapters 1 through 3 show us an agony of an unfaithful spouse. Look back with me at verse number 2 there. Chapter 1, verse number 2. The beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take unto thee a wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms, for the land hath committed great whoredom departing from the Lord. Now, the Lord asked him to go marry a harlot. That's just a bad idea. Now, the Lord did that uh, to show God's love. We'll see that. But young ones, that's a bad idea. Okay? Uh, Young ones, don't go marry a harlot, okay? Uh, Ladies, don't go marry uh, a man harlot, whatever that would be. And uh, don't do that. Uh, It's a bad idea. Amen. The family obviously had a lot of problems. Unfaithfulness causes pain. Now, I put that to say three times just to make sure you got this. Unfaithfulness causes pain. One more time. Unfaithfulness causes pain. Uh, Proverbs 25, verse 19, confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. And ha- trying to be confident in somebody who's not faithful, it's like having a broken tooth, not only just a broken tooth, but a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. You can't trust somebody. And this relationship with his unfaithful spouse was, was obviously a, a picture of agony of the unfaithful spouse. And uh, we think about that unfaithfulness causes pain. Unfaithfulness causes pain. They had three children, Jezreel and then a list two others. And uh, you think about the pain in the, the relationship with the husband. There was pain. But think about the children. The children were victims, obviously, also. There was problems. that uh, Children sure should have a, a husband and a wife that love each other. They should uh, grow up in a non-dysfunctional home. They should grow up with the security of parents. But it was dysfunctional, had problems. There was the unfaithfulness of the, uh, the, the wife right there. And, oh, it's a, a painful thing. Number two, go to chapter 3, if you will. Chapter 3, verse 1. You read the rest of chapter 1, it describes the unfaithfulness, describes problems. Chapter 2, it does. And the woman, 
she eventually leaves her husband. She gets uh, with other men, eventually gets into bondage with one of the men. And it says in verse number one, Then said the Lord unto me, Go yet, love a woman beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress, according to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel, who look to other gods and love flagons of wine. And number two, not the number one, the agony of an unfaithful spouse, but this, this shows the powerful love of a faithful husband. Amen. The powerful love of a faithful hus husband. This tragedy shows the husband's amazing love which in truth shows the amazing love of our great God. He loves us. He loves us despite of us. God is faithful. I want to say it again. God is faithful. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, it says, But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above your, that you're able. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3, it says, But the Lord is faithful. Now, the, the interesting, the northern kingdom of Israel was unfaithful. We put unfaithful, unfaithful, terrible, wicked. God loved them. They're the ones that were committing adultery. They're the ones that are going to Bethel and transgressing. They're the ones that refused to go to Israel or to, to Judah, to Jerusalem to do right. They're, they're refusing their God. But God is like that husband who has a love for them. Think about it. Jesus, uh, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. How many of you are sinners? Amen. Man, we all are. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Right. And you begin to think about that. Uh, how, how about sin with you and me? Uh, we are so sinful and so backwards, yet God loves us. For the wages of sin. And by the way, I put this. How do you see your sin? The people there thought it was no big deal. What's the big deal to go to Bethel? What's the big deal not to serve uh, the, this God that you're calling God? We, we serve these other gods. What's the big deal? And they, they're, a lot of times they didn't even see it. It was right before their eyes and they didn't even see it. It became normal after 200 years just to go to Bethel. That, that discussion of the big Solomon's temple was, yeah, discussion that was maybe talked about that, yeah, our great-great-grandfather used to have, but, but we're, we're uh, a little bit more learned than that. We have these gods that are better than the god uh, that Solomon served, and we go to Bethel. And you think about their sin was no big deal to them. And you think about us, is your sin a big deal? Amen. Hopefully you understand it is. It is a big deal to God. I hope it is. I was just hoping for a slight amen right there. Amen. Our sin is a big deal to God. Amen. The only way you can ever get gloriously saved is to realize you're a sinner. Yeah. You realize there's no hope in yourself. Right. That you realize the wages of sin is death. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18 says, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet. It's saying right there, your sins are scarlet. They're bad. Your sins are bad. To get saved, you have to realize that you are a sinner destined to die and go to hell for all of eternity. Right. Your only hope is not the church. Right. Your only hope is not uh, your reformed life. Your only hope is not to, to give money to the offering place or to the building fund. Well, <laughs> eh, I changed that one right there. Uh, no, of course, your money, it's not that giving money to the church. The only hope is Jesus and Jesus alone. Yeah. And praise God, praise God for that thought, the powerful love of a faithful husband, the powerful love of the Almighty God. Now, we come to this section, second section of Scripture, Hosea chapter 4 through 14. And so we're moving on to this. And this, really, Hosea is more of a personal testimony. And then it's going to re-illustrate that, uh, but directly at the nation of Israel in these chapters. And uh, these following chapters... It's interesting. It's just a series of sermons declaring the sin of God's people and the amazing character and love of God. So there's short sermon after short sermon after short sermon. You could look at it like a little sermon, little poem pieced together like this. And it's a piece here, piece here, piece here, piece here, piece here. And it comes together into a, a story of 14 chapters. But they're just little pieces of papers that are put together and they're pieced together telling us about how uh, the sin of God's people and the amazing love of God. Now, the tragedy of an unfaithful people, the, the nation is guilty. The nation is guilty. I'm going to say it again. Turn to Hosea chapter 4. 
the nation is guilty. Amen. Amen. Okay. And the nation is guilty and I erase this so I can draw another beautiful picture. Amen. Well, one of these days my artwork will be beautiful. Keep working on it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It's a work in progress. Okay. In this, Hosea chapter 4, you're going to start to see how uh, Israel is described. And uh, from Israel, Jeroboam, Bethel, the golden calves, the people went along with it. The people got used to their sin. The nation uh, was so far away from God. I've already said this, but it became normal uh, for the northern kingdom of Israel to serve sin, to serve self, to do things different than the God's way right there. In Hosea chapter 4, verse 16, look at verse 16. For Israel slideth back as a backsliding heifer. Now the Lord will feed them as a lamb in a large place. And so it describes uh, right there as Israel being a backsliding heifer. Do you see that? And so I was going to draw you a picture of a backsliding heifer. Let me see here. All right. All right, here we go. That's not a he Is that a heifer? I don't know. It, it's not very good. But think backsliding heifer right there. Look at chapter 6, if you will. Look at chapter 6. I'm going to erase this one quick. Okay. Chapter 6, verse number 4. O Ephraim, what, verse, chapter 6, verse 4, O Ephraim, what shall I do unto thee? O Judah, what shall I do unto thee? For your goodness is as a morning cloud, and as the early dew it goeth away. And so if you could think of the morning dew, like if you thought about grass, and then you just think about droplets on the grass. Now that's not a very good, but just pretend there's droplets. Now when you wake up in the morning, there's dew on the ground. There's sometimes a morning mist, a morning cloud, but it vanishes away quickly. The sun comes out, and just a few short minutes later, the morning dew is gone. It's saying, hey, Judah, hey, Israel, your goodness is as the morning cloud. It goes away quickly. It's not even there. It's good for nothing. So it's like a heifer, a backsliding heifer. Uh, the nation's like a morning dew. It's good for nothing. Go to, go to this one, if you will. Look at Hosea chapter 7. Verse number four, they are all adulterers as an oven heated by the baker who ceaseth from raising after he hath kneaded the dough until it be leavened. Verse number eight, chapter seven, verse eight, Ephraim, he hath mixed himself among the people. Ephraim is a cake not turned. And so think of a pancake. Uh, you have the pancake in the pan, but you never turn it. And it's doughy on one side, done on the other side. It's not, not good. It compares them to a backsliding heifer. It compares them to that undone pancake right there, you might say. It's saying that the sin of Israel was bad. Go a little bit further. Uh, Hosea chapter 7, verse 11. You're right there already. Ephraim also is like a silly dove without heart. They call to Egypt. They go to Assyria. And uh, the dove was known as just a, a silly bird, you might say. Have you ever seen uh, a dove that flies into your arm and they just have that look? Uh, silliness, right? Just like your look right there, Sister McMain, right there. A silly look right there. Sorry, Brother Randy. That was bad right there. That was bad. It, it's not bad. It's bad. <laughs> Move on, Pastor. And so I could draw a picture, Sister McMain. <laughs> but I won't. So praise the Lord. But the, the dove right there is saying, hey, Israel, you're going to Egypt for help. That's dumb. You're going to Assyria for help. That's not right. 
eventually we know that Assyria conquered the northern kingdom of Israel, do we not? Yes, we knew that. And so he say, you're silly to go to Egypt for help, to go to Assyria for help. You have something more powerful than that. You have the great God. You have God. You have God. Look at this one right here. Uh, we go to verse number seven, chapter 7, verse 16. They returned, but not to the most high. They are like a deceitful bow. Their princes shall fall by the sword for the rage of the tongue. This shall be the derision in the land of Egypt. It's like a deceitful bow. Sometimes a, a bow and arrow doesn't look all that powerful, but it's deadly. Uh, from a distance, just a bow, just an arrow, but death comes like that. It's a deceitful bow. And we look at that and we think about that. Israel was in, in just a, a midst of sinfulness. Now, real quick, uh, we're going to think with this. De describe Israel, Jeroboam, the golden calves. I said that. Um, but imagine with me a sincere man. And just imagine with me a sincere man. He has a family. He reads the Bible and realizes that he's doing, what he's doing is wrong. Imagine a man living in Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel. He gets a hold of the scriptures. He's living with this whole society that's wrong. He's living with this whole society where they go to Bethel and transgress. They worship a golden calf. But he begins to read the Bible, and all of a sudden he realizes what he's doing wrong. He decides to go to Jerusalem during the Passover. You're doing what? Your community wouldn't understand. Your family wouldn't understand. But that is because society has often been backwards. Do you understand that? Society has often been backwards. And so Hosea coming up to this backward society, the king would look at him and say, who are you? By the way, the nation of Israel said, what are you thinking? Yeah. Who do you think you are, Hosea? Right. Uh, but it didn't matter what society thought. It mattered what the God Almighty thought. That's right. And that's so important for us to remember even today. Because in truth, it's not much different than today. We live in a backward society that doesn't worship and honor the Almighty God, doesn't give heed to the Scripture, doesn't give heed to the prophet Hosea, you might say. We're backwards. But it continues on, uh, the results of an unfaithful people. And I want to say this, and look, look with me quickly to chapter 8. Really, we won't be much longer. We're going to be done in five minutes, I believe. Maybe six. Chapter 8, verse 14. It says, For Israel hath forgotten his maker, and buildeth temples, and Judah hath multiplied fenced cities. But I will send a fire upon his cities, and it shall devour the palaces thereof. And really, I put this, since is, the nation is guilty, okay, the nation of Israel is guilty. Do we understand? We agreed with that. Amen. Backsliding heifer, that's what all those, uh, the, uh, the midst and all that, they're, they're guilty, guilty, guilty. Yes, sir. Because of their guilt, God is just. Yep. And God's justice, his justice demands him to do right at all times. Now, this is a the theology 101. It's a Bible doctrine of God's justice. Because God is just, sin has to be paid for. Right. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And, and he begins to describe it. Go over to, real quick to Hosea chapter 13. Look at this. It's Hosea chapter 13, verse 16. The results of unfaithfulness to God. The results of an unfaithful people. Uh, chapter 13, verse 16, Samaria, that's the nation of Israel, shall become desolate, for she hath rebelled against her God. They shall fall by the sword. Their infants shall be dashed in pieces, and their women with child shall be ripped up. Well, that's great. But it did happen. It, that was a prophecy. It had not happened yet, but it happened. Assyria did come up. They killed the infants. The Assyrians were terrible. They were terrible. They took the wombs and ripped up the, the, the women that were with child. And they killed them. And, and it, was, it was gross, it was, but it was prophesied. God said, hey, I'm going to allow that to happen to you because you've turned to these idols. I'm going to allow this to happen to you because you don't serve me as your God. And wow, imagine the prophet saying that. Yeah, right. <laughs> Look at our prosperity. Look at how good we got it right now. What are you thinking? Nothing could hurt us. Well, our friends are Egypt. Egypt will protect us. Assyria will protect us. We're good to go. And little did they know as they turned their back on the Almighty God, and God allowed these things to happen. Now, uh, we know James chapter 1, verse 15, it says, uh, Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. For the wages of sin is death. Imagine with me the moral man who dies. A moral man lived a pretty moral life. 
didn't do, quote unquote, much wrong. He lived a moral life. He didn't think hell was real. Yep. Didn't think he needed to, to get saved. And all of a sudden, he dies. And he wakes up. And he's cast into the lake of fire. And he says, wait, wait. Don't, don't, don't you know I was a moral man? I didn't believe there was a hell. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41 says, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire. Why? Your sin has to be paid for. Yes, sir. And if you have to pay for your sin yourself, the only way you can pay for your sin yourself would be one day die and go to hell. Yes, sir. But Jesus loves you. Yes, sir. Died on the cross for your sins. Yes, right. He shed his precious blood. He gave his life for your life. He paid for your sins so you could go to heaven when you die. And boy, that's important for us to know the results of an unfaithful. Now, Israel, the nation, has hope. This is the last thing. I Turn over with me to chapter 11. I'm going to quickly, chapter 11, look at this. The results of an unfaithful people. Oh, it's bad because God is just. But the nation has hope because of God is love. The nation has hope because God is love. God is that faithful husband who loves his wife. But Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, when Israel was a child, then I loved him. And then it goes in chapter 11, verse 2, and burned incense to graven images. And it sort of describes Israel, uh, the dad loving the child, then the child beginning to rebel. And the dad goes through these different emotions where I love this child, but boy, I'm going to judge this child. And, but you see that God loves this child still has a plan for this child. Go to chapter 14, if you will. And this is where God's love provides a lot of hope. Chapter 14, verse 4. I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for mine anger is turned away from him. Chapter 14, verse 8. Ephraim shall say, what have I to do anymore with idols? In other words, Ephraim, the nation of Israel, gets right and no longer serves idols. By the way, you could look at this one day in the future prophecy. There's this future prophecy that will come to fulfillment. The nation of Israel will be restored and will have nothing to do with idols. God will be their God. Praise the Lord. Amen. By the way, we see the beginning of this with the nation of Israel becoming a nation. They still serve false gods. They're not serving the Lord yet. But there's coming a day, not too far in the distant future, where God's going to come back. There's going to be the seven-year uh, tribulation at the end. God's going to come back and stand on the Mount of Olives and it's going to start the millennial reign of Christ. And Israel will fulfill this prophecy and serve the Almighty God. We're seeing it happening right before our eyes. It's amazing. Then the last part, the amazing conclusion, chapter 14, verse 9. This is interesting. And if you were to memorize one scripture, it would be this. Look at this. Who is wise? And he shall have, uh, who is wise, and he shall understand these things. Prudent, and he shall know them. For the ways of the Lord are right. Now stop right there. The ways of the Lord are right. It didn't matter. Imagine Hosea preaching. He'd, he'd go to these people. Imagine this is the nation of Israel. And he'd say, boy, you've been wrong. Well, you've, you've gone as, as uh, that uh, adulterous woman, that harlot right there, and you've served all these other idols, and God loves you, though. Boy, turn back to the Lord. Hey, go, go instead of to Bethel. Go to Jerusalem. God is love. Boy, don't you understand that? The people, ha, 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 ha. Who cares right there? Who is this guy to think he is anyways? And the end conclusion right there, who is wise? The ways of the Lord are right. Doesn't matter what you think. Doesn't matter what I think. The ways of the Lord are right. Yes, right. Yes. Doesn't matter who says anything else. The ways of the Lord are right. right. It doesn't matter what the pres who the president is. It doesn't matter who, who's in the higher institute of learning. The way of the Lord is right. Amen. Amen. The last part of it says, and the just shall walk in them. So the just are going to listen to what God's word says and then walk in them. Yes, sir. The, the just are going to say, oh, thus saith the Lord. Hey, I'm going to be a part of that. But then it says, but the transgressors shall fall therein. Yep. Transgressor says, I don't need to know all that. Yep. It's no big deal anyways. And he turns around and walks the other way to a certain end of of destruction. Yes, sir. Boy, we want to be wise. Wise enough to listen to the word of the Lord, Hosea the prophet. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we love you. It's been a good night. The book of Hosea, 14 chapters. It's hard to even hit the tip of the iceberg of this wonderful book, but it's a wonderful book, Lord.
Help us to realize your love. Help us to realize that we're no better than anybody else. We've all sinned and come short of your glory. God, help us to realize your love for us. Help us to be willing to, if we're not saved, to realize our only hope for salvation is you, Jesus. Yes, sir. Then I pray that you please help us as a church to not look to the ways of the world, what society is doing, what society says is right, what society says is wrong, but help us to be willing to listen to the Hoseas. Help us to be willing to look to the Bible for answers, Lord. And we love you. Please bless in Jesus' name.